Public Radio is radio that matters, and our sustainers keep it going strong year after year. Thank you for your support of WFIU. From WFIU in Bloomington, Indiana, I'm Kate Young, and this is Earth Eats. One of which was sorghum Sudan grass, and if you don't mow that, it gets to be like 10 feet tall. And so we had pigs that were running through there that reminded us of the velociraptors from Jurassic Park. You know, you can't see the animal, you just see the top of the plant waving back and forth. So we were always on safari when we had to go out and do, do pig chores. This week on the show, we visit Nightfall Farm, a livestock farm in southern Indiana focused on sustainable agriculture. We talk about perennial pastures, rotational grazing, and what farmers can learn when they listen to their animals. We cover a lot of interesting ground in this conversation. I hope you'll stay with us. First this. Kate Young here, this is Earth Eats. Where I live in Southern Indiana, there's no shortage of farmland. When driving along rural state roads, you're bound to pass through acres of land devoted to corn and soybeans. We don't find those products at our local farmer's market though. Corn and soybeans are grown at an industrial scale and they're processed into other products, some of which feed animals, also raised at an industrial scale, and others find their way into processed foods that humans consume. And those acres of corn and soybeans are raised on land that is tilled year after year with the same crops planted, and chemical herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers are applied to the fields for predictable results. This week, we're devoting the show to a conversation about another way of farming. I recently visited Nightfall Farm near Crothersville, Indiana, to talk with Liz and Nate Brownlee about their farming practices. We started with a tour of their farm. It's land that belongs to Liz's parents, and they had been renting it out for decades to a larger neighboring farm before Liz and Nate took over eight years ago. So this was corn or soybeans for my entire growing up, you know, what, three and a half decades. We've been converting this to pasture over the last three years now. We did a year of cover crops where we planted things that would just build up the health of the soil um, and bring in pollinators. And then we planted it in a perennial pasture and we've added all these trees. So the tubes you see are all native trees that we've planted. And the whole idea is called silvopasture. You're adding trees into pasture, silvo is Latin for tree, and the, the benefits are many. Shade for our livestock, uh, we're sequestering carbon, obviously, by growing trees, and many of these trees are fruit and nut trees. So a lot of what you're seeing out here is actually persimmons, and so once they're big enough, we'll graft on cultivars of persimmons and hopefully be adding a new crop to our farm's business. That's like best case scenario, we get a new viable enterprise and crop and money maker. Worst case, we've got shade for our animals and and some fruit for them to to eat. And probably reality will be somewhere in between. We are not in a very fertile place. The soils here are heavy to clay. And so in the spring, it's wet as can be. And in the summer, it bakes dry. And (laughs) um, it's not easy to grow food. You know, this place does a really good job of being a forest. Eking out an organic vegetable operation or a pasture-based livestock operation, it would be easier if we had better soil. There's no doubt about that. So that's part of what it means to bring this place to life because what little fertility was naturally here has been pulled out Mm -hmm. by years of conventional farming. And so that's why we're doing the diversity of cover crops and then planting in a perennial pasture and then grazing the livestock is to, to bring these soils back to life. The... Things you're seeing closest along the road here, these are all shrub willows. Willows are really great at rooting from just a little stick. So we put 1,800 little sticks into the ground here, and we've got 
six rows of them? Yeah, spread throughout the field. And the potential benefits, one is just that we're expanding our sheep flock and sheep naturally get a lot of parasites. And so if you can keep them grazing up higher, the parasites don't crawl as high. They're closer to the ground level. So keeping their heads up off the ground, eating things like willows as opposed to eating grass down to nothing will mean healthier sheep. But we're also hoping some of the varieties that we got to plant are like floral varieties and some are for basket weaving. So we're hoping to find markets for those things over time. Hi girls. We approached a long high tunnel where some of their laying hens spend the night. In the past it had been the barn and it, you know, it's an old barn, it's in the woods, there wasn't a lot of light. And chickens need 14 hours of daylight to lay. This is so nice because they get every bit of sunlight and the warmth, like if it's 20 degrees out and it's sunny, this thing's 50 inside. And so they get a nice temperature boost. And you know, chickens are tropical birds. They would rather be a little warmer than colder. And so these guys, yeah, they have a paddock out the back right now. Tomorrow we'll shift it to over here where it's greener. Um, so they've got you know, green stuff to eat, or go after the bugs that are in the ground. So just having this kind of fencing makes it really easy to just adjust where they can exactly. forage. Exactly, yeah. This is this fencing, some people call it a net. So to kind of visualize it, it's three feet tall, and the, the net has openings that are, you know, maybe four by six at the top and smaller at the bottom. So the chickens can't get out. It's like a physical barrier to them, but it's electrified. So for a raccoon or something that's coming around to check it out, they get shocked if they try to go through but we can move it. It just has, each post just has a prong at the bottom, maybe six inches of metal that goes into the ground. And so we, we move those. It takes maybe a half hour, 45 minutes to build a new paddock and we can move them really frequently. Um, and that's really the basis of all things rotational grazing is we can move their fences frequently and quickly. It is labor intensive, but it's as sort of movable as possible. They like it, you know, they, they learn when it's fence moving time. And so these girls, we close them in the pens to move the fence so they don't just run around because we have to tear down these fences. But the sheep and the other chickens sometimes will have them loose right up by the edge of the fence because they know we're building a new fence and they're just waiting. <laughs> and as soon as we can open it, you know, they know that that means that it's buffet time and they, they explore very quickly. They find the perimeters of their fence and... Um, they, they find all the good spots, so the sheep will find one sweet spot and all the sheep will go there. Whereas the chickens, they spread out a little bit more and they, they like to stay a little closer to the shelters to feel safe, but they know as well as we do that it's, it's a good way to do it. Animals are moving to a fresh spot every single, yeah. every single day, so they always have fresh forage, they've got a clean place to be, it's not all manure or muddy, and so moving, they're moving within the, the paddock. Some of the chickens are kept in smaller, lightweight structures on bicycle wheels, a design called a chicksaw. Liz and Nate built them from plans that are available online from a farmer named Justin Rhodes. With this method, they fence off a large area called a paddock, and they move the chicks off forward a bit each day until the whole paddock has been grazed. Then they move the fencing forward and start over with a new paddock. With the chickens, they don't stray too far from the shelters. And by moving those, that's how we utilize this entire area. And so it's some of it's based on the behavior of the animal, just yeah. what you know they do. And, and, you know, they're always teaching us what they want to do. So part, part of our job is observing. So if, if we see them acting differently than we ever have before, that means we got to learn something. Maybe, maybe they're sick and we need to learn why. Or maybe we haven't noticed a hawk that's in the air, but they've seen it. And so it's kind of thrown them off. Uh, peacocks. The, the neighbor has peacocks. They used to have chickens. And so I think the peacock was lonely. So he started coming out to hang out with our birds, and we saw our egg numbers drop precipitously. We didn't know why, but all of a sudden we weren't getting as many eggs as we were expecting. And then we started seeing peacock poop on the road in front, and we realized that he'll come out there. They don't know him, even though he knows chickens, and he'd display, and it would scare the birds. And so they just kind of held on to their eggs a little bit because they were uncomfortable. And, you know, it's, it's those things that happen when we're not around that we have to react to based on the cues that they're giving us. Yeah. I asked about the pasture, in particular the small grass seedlings I could see sprouting up in rows. 
We had a contract with the USDA to convert this from annual crop ground into perennial pasture. They support anything that benefits health of the soil or clean water. And they helped us figure out what we should plant here based on our soils and what animals we wanted to graze. So the first year we planted, it was a total fail. It was a super dry fall. But the second year, it's taken better. So yeah, so what we plant with is a drill from the county and it's a no-till drill. And so it basically has these different lines that it plants in. It just, it makes a little furrow, a little strip, and then it drops the seed in and then it has these two wheels that pushes the soil back together. It was a five species mix. So we've got some grasses and some legumes. So you can see some of the, the red clover we planted. Yeah. The other stuff that's out here growing, it's all just weeds and that's okay. With chickens, like their, their main thing that they're getting from the pasture in terms of nutrients is bugs. And bugs are gonna be anywhere where the soil's healthy enough for them to be. So if it's a little bit weedy, that's okay. Um, and are these chickens meat or? These are laying hens. These are laying yeah, hens. so these guys are uh, 17 weeks old and they're just starting to lay their eggs. It's 140 hens here and so we should expect 70 to 80 percent production once they're up and running. So, you know, what is that? That's over 100 eggs a day from this flock. With the pandemic, um, egg, supply, egg demand just rose pretty dramatically. And so we expanded the flock last year to get to 100 because of the pandemic and now we're at 140, uh, which is still really small, <laughs> no doubt about it. And they're not exclusively eating pasture, they also Correct. are fed. Yes, yeah, so the only animals that are 100% grass-fed are the sheep. Wow. You know, they're, they're um, ruminants, they have four-parted stomach, they can turn grass into everything they need. But the, ch the chickens and the pigs and the turkeys, um, they all have digestive systems a lot more like ours. Okay. Um, so they can't just eat grass. They're getting maybe tops 20% from the pasture. Yeah, like their nutrient intake. But they're getting other things from it. They're getting diversity of diet. They're getting clean, healthy space to live, sunshine, room to run around and be, you know, root around and be pigs or yeah. hop around and be lambs. You'll see that in a minute. It was time to visit the sheep. I saw a few dozen white puffs with legs dotting a picturesque green field surrounded by trees close to their house. So you are looking at 17 ewes, the mamas, and 30 lambs. And the lambs are all, what, they're four to ten weeks old? <laughs> I think they're so chill. Yeah. They're just laying around. It's so hilarious how they wag their little tails. Oh, I know. <laughs> and the sound is just random? Or are they telling each other stuff? You don't know? No idea. <laughs> yeah, no idea. I mean, it's clear when, when we're building a paddock, what we'll do is we'll have a place where the, the fences come together and we'll open that up. It's kind of like a gate and they just walk into the next paddock. Or run. Or run. And they know that, they're, they know what's happening. And so they're, they're ready to move. They know that there's more food over there. Like the grass is literally greener on the other side. And so they will talk. They will tell you. And we won't even be able to talk anymore. It'll be loud enough, the sheep calling, that we can't hear each other. So we've gotten pretty good at doing like silent moves. And then you open it up and it goes silent. The sheep all run right through and get right to work eating. And they don't, they're not calling anymore. I'm trying to think how best to describe this. The, the sheep paddocks are roughly rectangles. And so there was a rectangle that went, you see the mowed yep. patch there? It went from here to there. And in the distance, you see longer grass. And that's how big it is when they come into a paddock. It's eight to 10 inches tall, at least. And then they leave behind this. It's more like three to four to six inches tops. And then we move them to the next space. So the amount of time in a given paddock is based on how much they're eating and how many animals are in the fence. So this year with a much expanded flock, we're gonna to have to move a lot faster and build bigger fences. But they were here for basically 24 hours, then they went to the next paddock over, and then last night we shifted them to this, this new fence that you see. Wow, really, so it's a day. And that can change. Like once we're on the, the more official pasture, this is just a stopgap. <laughs> the bigger pasture, the grasses are gonna be more like 16 inches going into the paddock. And so they're gonna have more forage. There's just more to eat. So each paddock will last a little longer. Because we're going off of observation. There's no like clear cut set point. Are we moving the sheep? You know, it's not a mandatory. They move every day 
So that's constantly assessing and discussing. Yeah, so if we're both yeah. doing chores in the evening, we're walking around saying, well, do you think do you think it's time to move them? No, they look good. Or, oh, yeah, we definitely need to move them. And, you know, decision fatigue is something that I think because there's two of us here, you know. Oh it's a gosh. real thing. It's a real thing. But, you know, that's, I think that's part of the beauty of rotational grazing is we have a reason to be with the animals every 12 hours, checking in on them, seeing how they're doing, observing them and their paddock. And that's fun, one, like we enjoy the animals. And, and two, we think it helps us do a better job. You're really in touch. There's no just set it and forget it. There's no set it and forget it. If you figure that out, you let me know. But... Before we sat down in the shade for our interview, we passed by a barn with turkey chicks who weren't quite old enough for pasture. Liz and Nate don't raise turkeys year-round, but they were trying out a small flock this spring, and they always raise some in the fall for Thanksgiving. So it's a mix of males and females? Usually in the fall, yes, but these are all toms. Uh, oh. w- when we're, we're looking for parting up a turkey, for ground turkey or legs or wings, the boys usually get bigger and it's uh, more cost effective. But for the fall with Thanksgiving, you know, we end up with a lot of customers that want a nice small bird because it's just them, an immediate family or a small gathering. And then we have a whole different set of customers that want a great big bird because they're having a huge get together, which works well. Those are the hens are smaller naturally, the toms are bigger naturally. And so we can try to please the customers that want the 14-pounder and the ones that want the 24-pounder. 14 sounds like a lot (laughs) to me. (laughs) We, um, I, I love Thanksgiving in part because people get so excited about cooking that special meal, you know, and and getting their meat from us. But I also really like leftovers. So that's, I go for the 20-pound bird every time. And it's worth the effort to then eat on that. And, yeah. you know, turkey actually freezes really well. So we put a bunch in the freezer and just mm-hmm. pull from that. Yeah. I will write that down. I'm speaking with Liz and Nate Brownlee of Nightfall Farm. After a short break, we'll hear more from our visit, including a discussion of how they went from strident vegetarians to livestock farmers. Stay with us. Kate Young here. This is Earth Eats. Back to my interview with Liz and Nate Brownlee of Nightfall Farm. I wanted to hear about their backgrounds and what brought them to this farm and to this work. Uh, I was born out in Colorado, but my family moved back and forth between Colorado and Indiana a couple times. So since third grade, Indiana is home and uh, I grew up in Franklin. So my parents are still just an hour up the road. My parents both grew up on farms in Jackson County, and when they got married, they knew they wanted a farm, and they rented ground for a while, and then they ended up buying this place. And I grew up here. It's a kind of standard small farm in that they did a little of this and a little of that and didn't make any money. (laughs) So when I grew up, we were on the farm, but there was no farming happening. So being a rural kid in the country, I did 4-H all 10 years, and I was in FFA, but I never had a desire to be a farmer. And in fact, I was told, get off the farm, right? Like, if you want to make a living, you need to leave. You need to get an education and leave. And so it wasn't until I fell in love with sustainable farming and farming as a way to enact my environmental ethics that I started to think about coming back here and turning it into something new and different, like turning this farm into a sustainable piece of the puzzle. And how did that happen? Well... Nate had taken some classes related to sustainable agriculture kind of right when we met, and I came to it on my own as well. We both were vegetarians for a while. We were thinking a lot about what we were eating, and I don't know, we just said, like, we should probably try this. Like, let's let's see if we can become farmers. We woofed on a farm for about three months um, in Pennsylvania. Just What's woofing? So woof is an acronym uh, for Willing Workers on Organic Farms. Basically, it's a work trade. So it was a good way to try out farming without committing a long time to it. So we were woofing on an organic veggie farm in Pennsylvania and just had a blast. And we said, like, great, let's do this. We ended up finding work up in Maine on a demonstration farm there. And we had the pleasure of finding really good farmers who took us under their wings and showed us 
how rotational grazing works and how you can raise animals in an ethical way that builds up the health of the land and sell good meat and good eggs and build up a community all at the same time. And so we started to say, you know, if we want to do this, like home is the logical place to go. I'm just curious about the vegetarian part. So you were vegetarians, but then you started learning more about sustainable meat. So we were vegetarians for four years, and it was very important to us. And it was mostly because of the way we perceived animals being cared for in the industrial meat system. And when you're younger, you kind of don't necessarily do nuance or gray area well. You're just like, boom, this is exactly how I believe and how I will act. And I'm glad we did that because it it led us to our exploration of small farms. And as we got to really see more farms, explore the the depth of what a farm could be, we realized that the best way to have a farm was to have animals. You know, animals are a very great source of nutrients. They are a great source of disturbance for the soil to help cycle things. They're, for us, a, a great reward. We, we really enjoy working with them. And if we take animals out of the equation, fertility has to come from somewhere. So it's going to be synthetic most of the time, or it's going to be an animal product that the farmer's buying in. And so we really started thinking deeper about what it meant to have animals as a part of our food system. And we were just, on a daily basis, having in our faces farmers that were treating their animals well and understanding that we don't like killing animals. You know, that's always a hard day for us when we take animals to the butcher. Still is eight years in and it will be until we're done. But that hard day, if it's mixed with a good life, felt a little more comfortable than it did you know when we were first starting out and so we we actually the first meat we ate after deciding not to be vegetarians was meatloaf at a grazing conference (laughs) and uh, probably not the first thing you would think of as being like your entry back into to meat but uh we'd been working on this farm in Maine as educators primarily it was a demonstration farm but they also had a farmer who raised beef cattle for them and he just sort of took a shine to us which was really kind and we took a shine to him for sure Pete was great and he started showing us how rotational grazing works and we were very curious and we ended up being able to go to this grazing conference and we said like well we better put our money where our mouth is like if lunch is meatloaf and mashed potatoes we can't just eat the mashed potatoes and you know, we still eat less meat than I think most Americans do on principle. We don't we don't need nearly as much meat as we eat in this country. And if you're eating really high quality meat, like we have the privilege of doing, definitely don't need as much. Like a little goes a long way because it's packed with nutrients and brings you lots of health benefits and, and it tastes good. And so like last night for dinner, we had a vegetarian pot pie. And that's just like part of our diet still, lots of vegetarian meals and then our own meat and, and meat from our fellow farmers. Yeah. We talked about some of the upsides and downsides of raising animals. With vegetables, you know, you can raise five crops on the same piece of ground in a season. People are a little more comfortable spending $5 on a bag of lettuce than they are $18 on a chicken. And so it's in some ways a harder sell. And it's diversified in some ways, but not in others. You know, all we have is meat and so, well, and eggs, but... We're only going to catch the people that come to market prepared to take home some frozen food. Mm-hmm. And I guess really the the genesis of how we became meat farmers is twofold. One, we like to joke that cows are more charismatic than carrots. You know, we the way we like spending our time, we enjoy that interaction. We like seeing the animal's eyes looking at us and, and getting that moving reminder that we're, we're doing something. And, and, you know, they don't say thank you, but they definitely tear into their food that we bring them or, you know, enjoy the new pasture. Uh, and then the other reason is just that we we wanted to do one thing really well. The farms we worked on in, in Maine and Vermont, they were all trying to simultaneously have a diversified livestock operation and a 10-acre organic veggie operation and do deliveries all the way down to Boston, but also to their next door farmer's market. And they were just trying to do everything, you know, and meat processing and, and, and. And, and they have bigger businesses. And than they have we do. bigger businesses and crews of 25. And we felt like if we tried to do all the things, we'd do all of them with mediocre quality. And so we wanted to do a focused set of, of things. We wanted to just raise our animals and, and do that really well. Mm-hmm. And so that, that focus on 
caring for the animals well and, and using them as a way to rebuild the land and and try to bring some life to rural Indiana. That's been our focus, and um, here we are in year eight. <laughs> this was not the most logical place to be because we're not right beside a booming market place. You know, we're not near an urban center with a lot of customers. Mm -hmm. The land is flat, it is poorly drained, it's heavy clay soils, like it doesn't lend itself to fertile farming. But I really do believe that rural places can can be alive again, you know, that we don't have to be this forgotten place in the middle of the country and we don't have to lean into a certain sort of politics because of that. I, I think they can be places where people have a lot of different philosophies and ideas and businesses and that we can bring some energy here and... Um, now I'm just preaching, but I just, I really believe in rural places, and so I want to enact that with our business. What has been the process of transforming the farm from what it was? The, the transition has been a little bit of a time. So we started with one particular field that's right across from the house, and so we could walk to it, and it was 13 acres. It was something we could bite off. And that first year we had four pigs, 300 chickens, and 45 turkeys, and that was it. And everything since then has just been a response. Mm -hmm. So we've been responding to markets, so raising more animals. We've been responding to lessons we learned from the pasture, so knowing that we need to have more ground or that we need to have better drained ground. And so we, we have taken those observations and those lessons and, and gradually changed the farm to be what it wants to be as well as what we want it to be. Mm -hmm. And most of that's through systems, you know, like adding a new pasture or changing the system we use for the, the laying hens to, to meet the reality of our place. So what were the animals grazing on before, like when you first started? We moved back to a blank slate. Uh, it had been, it was beans in that field mm -hmm. uh, the year before. And so we planted three rounds of cover crops. So we had a summer annuals, a fall cover crop, and then another round of summer annuals before we planted a perennial pasture that second fall. So the first year was fantastic. We, we didn't have a tractor for the first five years of our farm. Yeah. <laughs> and so we planted in a mix of five or six different summer annuals, one of which was sorghum sudan grass. And if you don't mow that, it gets to be like 10 feet tall. And so we had pigs that were running through there that reminded us of the velociraptors from Jurassic Park. You know, you can't see the animal, you just see the top of the plant waving back and forth. So we were always on safari when we had to go out and do do pig chores. But they, they, the Sorghum Sudan puts in a really thick, like, cigar-style stalk that the pigs would break off and chew on, get the sugar out of, so it looked like they were old mobsters smoking on stogies. <laughs> um, but there was small stuff in there as well uh, and for the chickens to lay over and... They, were, um, they loved it. Well, yeah, so there was also, we had sunflowers, and so they would knock those over and eat those. The turkeys especially got full advantage of the sunflowers. So a cover crop is really neat to graze because it's got a lot of food um, for the animals. And then it leaves behind a ton of organic matter, right, dead plant matter, um, in the soil from the roots and above ground. And so then we planted in the perennial pastures, and, and that brings a whole different set of food for the animals. So over time, you're transforming it from what was just row crops of corn and soybean into yep. a diverse landscape and pasture land. and Exactly, yes. Yeah. So what we've, our goal specifically has been to, when, like when we say to bring this place back to life, yeah, to turn it from what was a monoculture to a diverse functioning ecosystem. You know, I, I count one of our biggest wins like a year ago or so we saw for the very first time these giant beetles called carrion beetles. And I saw them and I was sure it was like some invasive bug and it was a bad indication and something had gone wrong. And then we went in and Googled them. These huge beetles, like a hard black shell with a big yellow spot on there. And they're quite distinctive. And they only show up where there's enough dead things, meaning like a mole that's died or something, right? And you can only have detritivores, right? The the things that eat dead stuff, the animals that eat dead stuff, in an ecosystem where there's actually a fully functioning food web. And so I felt like, oh, it's this is working. Like, not only do we have spiders and dragonflies and birds showing up, but we even have the detritivores. I think maybe a good way to explain it is that we make plans for the farm and we enjoy the ways that it takes those ideas and turns them into reality. So, <laughs> you know, we put in a diverse mix of forages for our animals 
and lots of other things have grown. So because we didn't have a tractor for five years, we've got a lot of saplings coming up in the pasture. Terrible for chicken tractors because it's really hard to pull over the saplings, but absolutely great for the sheep to graze off, you know, tree leaves that are at sheep height. The pigs have gotten some shade from some of the ones that we've let get really tall. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that gives a lot of the tree frogs places to be. You know, the things that we weren't consciously planning on have been really fun indicators that there is enough life here that it's doing it on its own. You know, we're, we're not trying to control everything. And that is thrown in our face on a daily basis <laughs> because there's a lot happening out there that was not part of our, our vision or our plan but other than just letting it do what it wants. Yeah, but it's beautiful. It is beautiful. Yeah. This place is really beautiful. Oh, thank you. I'm very grateful to my parents. A lot of beginning farmers don't have family land. Land access is like the number one hurdle for most people. Where, how can they afford land to farm when it's being sold at development prices, you know? So the fact that we could come back here and, and settle in a place with so many trees and so much life already happening around it. And, you know, it doesn't hurt that we're on a dead end road. We really, <laughs> we really like that. We feel very fortunate to have some peace and quiet here. Liz and Nate sell their farm products through their CSA, to a few restaurants in the surrounding area, wholesale to a small grocery store in Seymour, and through farmer's markets. We sell at the Madison and Seymour farmer's markets, which is a conscious decision. Those are not big markets, but we've worked really hard to try to develop the markets and be part of lifting those markets up. Um, so as opposed to driving to Broad Ripple or Bloomington or Louisville, we stay closer to home and, and try to emphasize feeding our neighbors. So the, you know, the reality when we got started was that we didn't have enough product for those bigger farmers markets. We never would have been selected to be a vendor. But even as we grew, we realized like we can drive 20 or 30 minutes and, and find enough customers for our size farm. So we continue to sell out with the CSA and with farmer's market sales, and we feel like those markets are just getting a little better every single year, and that feels very good. They talked about the difference between rural and urban customers' expectations. We have had plenty of people look at us like we're crazy asking for $5 a dozen for eggs. If we were in an urban area, we could charge seven for the exact same product, but we'd have to drive farther to get there. Uh, and the fee to be at market would be higher, et cetera. But convincing customers who, you know, think of eggs as being 99 cents a dozen, that it's worth it to pay five, it is a convincing, you know? Like, we have to educate our customers at, at the, the smaller town markets. But the other thing I see that I think is worth pointing out is that, you know, if you go to Madison, Indiana, getting access to good quality food, it, you have to drive to Louisville. It's an hour drive or drive to the farm itself. And so when we showed up and said, hey, we've got all this meat for you guys, people were pumped. It was, it was, we were clearly filling a niche that was there. Now, could we move three times as much product through that market? Maybe not, but there's definitely more demand than, than we can supply. And we're seeing other farmers start to sell meat and eggs at that market. Um, just in the last year or so, there have been more meat and egg farmers show up. And that's been good because there's a more consistent supply than we can provide on our own. And it's fun for us because now we have more farmer friends. If you're just joining us, I'm speaking with Liz and Nate Brownlee of Nightfall Farm near Crothersville, Indiana. More from our conversation after a short break. Thanks for listening to Earth Eats. I'm Kate Young, and my guests are Liz and Nate Brownlee of Nightfall Farm. Could you talk a little bit about how the way that you raise meat is different from the way the majority of meat is raised? Sure. So over 90% of the meat consumed in this country is coming from CAFOs. That's a confined animal feed operation. Those animals are inside of barns with slatted floors where their poop falls down and into a big pit below them. Um, they never see sunlight. The conditions can be as good as possible in a CAFO and it's still a CAFO. Those animals don't get to be themselves. They're not eating a diverse diet. Um, we have neighbors who have CAFOs and they are good guys, but the system, the, the sort of the food system in this country has encouraged CAFOs and, and industrial scale production in a way that it turns into, I think, a real problem, right? And environmentally, it's a problem in terms of pollution, but it's also a problem in terms of just like flavor and nutrition. <laughs> so 
I'm a bad judge of this because I haven't had meat from a grocery store in over a decade, but people regularly tell us, oh, I didn't know a chicken could taste like that. I didn't know pork chops could have that much flavor. And it's because when you raise animals in confinement, they don't have a diverse diet, they're not as active, and so the meat just doesn't taste as good. So, we try to talk mostly though about what's special about what we're doing as opposed to like disparaging of the alternative, but it is important for, for people to understand what, the, what they're getting at the grocery store most of the time. And it's kind of a nasty thing to talk about, and so we all kind of avoid it, I think. So what we're trying to do here is, a, is an alternative to that. So we're raising the animals outside where they have fresh air and sunshine and plenty of room to be sheep and be pigs and be chickens, forage and wallow and lounge around in the sun and graze. And the diversity of diet that they get and the healthy, clean lifestyle that they get turns into a really healthy animal and high quality meat. And so then there's a big piece of the puzzle there that has to do with our customers, the, qu- the product that they're getting and also the fact that they're choosing to prioritize buying good meat. Because we know our product's expensive. There's no way to do this inexpensively. It's labor-intensive, high-quality feed costs more, a good butcher costs more, etc. We are definitely not getting rich doing this, but for the customers who can and who can choose to prioritize this, this sort of meat, I think they see that it makes their lives richer and, and healthier. But that means the person has to be paying attention. And have time to pay attention. You know, you make a good point. It's not just the money. It's, it's the extra effort to go find the farmer. To find the farmer and, and to choose to spend their money that way. You know, I really take a lot of pride in the fact that we have CSA members who really span the sort of economic gamut. They're not all professors and lawyers and doctors. We have a lot of members who are teachers and factory workers and nurses and farmers and that really that really means a lot to me because these are not people of great means. It's just that they're choosing to spend their money on good food. Now, there's a whole separate issue, right, of people who cannot afford to make that decision, and we as a country have to figure that out. But more people could afford good local food than who are buying it if they prioritized it. What about processing the animals? Is it all one day? Is it all one time in the season? Do you do it in stages? Like, how does that work? So since we have all different types of animals, it is spread out and, you know, joined together in different ways. Uh, Chickens, throughout the growing season, we're butchering every three weeks. And that process for us is a 3 a.m. wake-up call and then we put all the chickens into the coops that we transport them with and drive two and a half hours to the closest butcher and wait all day for them to butcher the chickens and then drive them home and put them in the freezer. We sell enough chickens, we raise enough chickens that we can't process here on farm. We worked at a state inspected processing facility so we know how to do it and we're good and safe and we would love to put those nutrients to use here on the farm, the the blood and the feathers and the offal, but it keeps doors open to go through a state inspected processor. They do a great job. They're a fair price that they charge, and we've had a great relationship with them. It's about two and a half hours, so that's why we have to get up at three because they need to be there between seven and seven thirty. So that means on the road by five. So that gives us time to eat a quick breakfast and then load all the chickens up and get on the road. We do that fairly often, and it's choreographed and just routine. Uh, All the other animals, it's a little bit harder because A, they're bigger, so loading into the livestock trailer takes a little more planning and Mm -hmm. staging and setup of equipment. And those days we don't look forward to because we miss them, you know, and we feel bad about being friends, you know, for their life and then just saying, all right, hop on the trailer, it's time to go. The best way I can explain the processing is we try to follow the mantra of good life, good death, good butcher, good chef. We're only responsible for a small portion of that, as it turns out, like how meat gets to somebody's table involves all four pieces of that puzzle. But we take really seriously the good life and we do our very best that the good death is under our control as much as we can too. So by partnering with good processors that have humane practices, by making the loading process as low stress as possible for the animals 
ideally by finding butchers that are as close to home as possible so the travel time is shorter for the animals. But that's tough. There aren't enough small-scale processors in Indiana or anywhere in the country, in fact. We do have a nearby lamb and goat processor, which is awesome. So we take our sheep only about a half hour away. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not our favorite part of this profession. The butcher days are always sad days. Um, you did ask about the timing. So the, the sheep and the pigs are really all towards the fall. We try to have them out on pasture for the full grazing season and then butcher at the end of the grazing season. Not It doesn't make it easier, but because everything generally is pushed towards that fall season, we're tired by then. And so while we don't enjoy taking the animals to the processor, we see the like relief in work and our daily schedule that that brings. You know, we we get tired, and so it it is the time of year that we can start recovering a little bit. And you know, it's it's seasonal. We we're just like the world. We get get to rest and recover a little bit, and then spring out and ready to go for another season. Before they started their farm, Liz and Nate had a chance to work in a small scale chicken processing plant through a farming apprenticeship program in Vermont. That was, that was a really useful experience in a million ways. I would work on the, what we called the dirty side, so I was on the kill floor, and Nate was on the clean side, like uh, eviscerating and parting and packaging. And so we got a, just a ton of experience. I'm, I am grateful that that's not my every single day, um, that I just did it for a chunk of time. We learned a ton from that that does still influence what we do. In recent years, I've done a little bit of fishing, mm-hmm. and I, I have to say that eating fish that I've caught is the best meal that I ever awesome. can eat. And I'm, and fish isn't my favorite food or anything, but it's just to feel like, okay, I went through the whole process. I faced the killing of this thing, and I faced the cleaning of it, and the stinky part, and like, you know, everything that's not fun about it, and it just feels different. Just that you faced it, that you faced the whole cycle. We are disassociated now, you know, it's, it's all marginalized to people who take care of it for you and you get the styrofoam cellophane wrapped package that you don't have to deal with and that, that felt like a big turning point in our lives and once we started participating fully, like you said, that, that made everything just taste better and, and feel more complete. You, you know, you're nourishing your soul. Another thing that we hear a lot is, you know, we name uh, some or a lot of our animals and we get customers that say well, I could never name them because I know what's going to happen at the end and we'll, we'll hear some stories from people that grew up on farms and they named their first cow burger because they wanted to remember that I'm going to get attached to you but you're going to become a burger that I eat and for us we think that naming them in some ways attaches you and that's a good thing it makes that last day that harvest day that butcher day harder but because we care while they're alive deeply and let ourselves get you know grow that attachment we're going to want to do the best by them that we can and that makes that last day maybe way heavier but the getting to that last day gives us the strength to do it and to feel like we did it right and did it well and and not have permission to do it, but aren't doing it flippantly and really appreciate the gravity of what we're doing. Mm-hmm. What does what does land stewardship mean to you? Hmm. Being a steward of the land is very important to both of us. You know, we debate pretty regularly about whether big scale change or small scale change is actually going to solve the world's problems. And I think obviously we need both, right? But the change we can make here on our farm is small-scale change, for sure. But the one thing we can do to try to save this planet and try to rebuild our communities is take really good care of these 250 acres. We have that privilege and we have that responsibility. So we talk about eyes to acres ratio. So if you think about a corn and soybean farmer who's raising 4,000 acres of corn and soybeans, right? That's, you know, his eyes, maybe, maybe two or three people doing that operation tops, right? So that's, let's say, three sets of eyes on those 4,000 acres. We have two sets of eyes on, for a long time, what was only 13 acres, really, but like, let's say the whole 250. We have two humans whose whole responsibility is to be on this land and to see what it needs and respond to what it needs and care for it. So the eyes to acres ratio is much better than if we were trying to care for 4,000 acres. 
that that ratio is really important to us that we're here and we're trying to listen and observe and i really do think that we vote three times a day with our fork on what how we want the land to be cared for and what businesses we want to support but at the same time that can be overwhelming and lead to this like confusion about like well do i buy this package of broccoli or that one and like then people threw up their hands and buy a frozen pizza right yeah there's so, so much guilt with food there's so much guilt with food yeah you said you said voting with your voting with your fork and it's uh it's definitely something that i think about a lot and really wonder about the power of that for change because what i see is niche markets yeah i know i know i think the reason it resonates with me this idea that we vote with our fork three times a day is because the people who buy food from us are the ones who are letting us be here on this farm right now. We need to be here making change because Indiana needs change. Okay. How do we get to a different kind of of system? I don't personally believe that it's only through voting with your fork. For sure, yeah. I think that it also has to be like fighting for for change in, in, in at a legislative level and a which is not as fun as going to farmers markets. <laughs> it will, and it just starts to get discouraging, you know, like very quickly. Well, an example is like the last week, week before, we got to be on a call with Senator Braun, which was great. And we got to share what some of our policy concerns are. And at the end of that 30 minute call, the reality is like, I'm now gonna go back to my farm work and somebody, some lobbyist from the, you know, pork producers of America is gonna continue after their 30 minute call with Senator Braun continue to work on the policy needs because they get paid probably a lot of money <laughs> to do that full time. Yeah. And so they just, there, there are more resources working against us than for us, unfortunately. So in thinking about climate change and the future of food and, you know, things I'm sure you guys do spend some time thinking about, what role do you think meat plays in that? So we definitely get pushback from people who say that, you know, like, it's time to stop eating meat. Hey world, no more meat. And we get that. Uh, we get that that impetus to say like, meat is definitely a contributing factor to climate change. We should eat less meat. We completely agree less, but the science is really clear that animals grazing livestock can be a part of stopping climate change. And in fact, we can be a part of that on a really small scale. And that's exciting to us. Um, so good grazing practices can sequester more carbon than the farm puts out. And so we feel really strongly that we shouldn't be taking livestock off the table as a solution. Climate change really scares me. Like we already are seeing it here. The intense rain events, you know, two or three inches in a day or a night, that has big impacts on our business, right? On the animals out on the pasture and, and then intense heat and, you know, heavy, heavy storms in general, thinking about wind and shelters out on pasture. Like all these things actually have practical implications for us right now. And I think when we started farming, we thought like, oh, we'll have to worry about climate change in 20 or 30 years. And it's just not the case. Like, we are worried about it right now. Um, and we take a lot of pride in the fact that we're helping fight it right now. And we're taking this land out of corn and soybean production, which was absolutely contributing to climate change and putting it into something that can fight climate change. But we can't do it alone. Like, obviously, we need a lot of, a lot of farms doing this sort of thing. And Americans are not going to stop eating meat tomorrow. And you can make all the lab-made meat you want, but that's not going to replace most Americans' meat consumption. And neither is our farm, right? We No jokes about that. Like, we don't want to fool ourselves. <laughs> but meat raised in a way that's um, ethical and good for the planet and sourced locally, that can have, like, a building effect. Those goods build on each other. And so if we were all eating less meat that was raised more locally and raised in a way that was... Um, adding carbon back to the soil, that could be a big swing. Like, there's actual data that supports that and shows how this could help if we can get people on board with it. Yeah, it, it goes back to that nuance that we were talking about earlier where, you know, if we're saying industrial meat, yeah, absolutely, that's a big contributor to climate change and eating no industrial meat would be a great thing for the world. Mm -hmm. um, but on, on our scale of farm and our, our style of farm, by grazing it, we keep that land open. It's not put into parking lots or houses. And it is in a system that is sequestering carbon, is helping take care of rain events because it's not, you know, an impermeable surface and it is something that can handle water, just maybe not as 
quickly or in the volumes that we've been seeing lately. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's hard, it, it's hard to have that conversation because if you're just scanning the headlines on news sources, it, it, it they are saying don't eat meat. It's meat's bad for the planet. You know, you got cow burps and cheap farts and, um, it's something that farmers talk about. You know, we, we understand that animals contribute, um, but they can also help. And it, it, if you are conscious of the way you're caring for your animals, you're probably also caring for the planet at the same time. I've been speaking with Liz and Nate Brownlee of Nightfall Farm. You can find photos from their farm and more about their work on our website, eartheats.org. The Earth Eats team includes Aavon Binder, Alexis Carvajal, Alex Chambers, Toby Foster, Daniela Richardson, Samantha Schemenauer, Peyton Whaley, and Harvest Public Media. Special thanks this week to Liz Brownlee and Nate Brownlee. Earth Eats is produced and edited by me, Kate Young. Our theme music is composed by Aaron Toby and performed by Aaron and Matt Toby. Additional music on the show comes to us from Universal Production Music. Our executive producer is Eric Bolstridge. Thank you.